present theme of our country, which is Make in India. My address is on the challenges in the development of helicopters in India. Getting straight to the indigenous development, to start with, no country can be deemed a superpower if it cannot meet its weapon and platform requirements indigenously. Secondly, given the unique nature of our terrain in the subcontinent, interestingly, our subcontinent packs such a variety of terrain, starting from salt pans to deserts, high altitudes, high altitude deserts, rainforests, coastal plains, high plateaus. Normally, all these are found in two continents at least. So we need to make machines which are unique to our terrain and our requirement. And plus, all of this is at ISA plus 20, not for the European uh, winters. Thirdly, a local uh, design can be quickly adapted to changing user requirements as and when our users or services require it. Obviously, there will be large economic benefits out of it. And uh, Lastly, it can be used as a diplomat diplomatic tool for increasing our area of influence across the world. For example, our machines are operating in Afghanistan, Nepal, Maldives, Mauritius, Seychelles, Namibia, and as far as Suriname also. And of course, we cannot rule out the national pride which comes with indigenous development. Indigenous Develop, uh, helicopters have been inducted in large numbers, 185 Dhruvs since 2001, 76 Rudras since 2014, and starting from this financial year, we'll be inducting 179 LCH. And India can claim to have succeeded in meeting its helicopter requirements of up to 6 ton class with indigenous designs. Let's have a look at what is the flowchart for design and development. It all starts with requirements listed in the ASR, NSR and GSQR. From these requirements, the design houses will decide on the design features and the technology to be used in the machine. If the technology does not exist in the country, then we go in for consultancy from abroad. And once the uh, flying is done, and the uh, prototypes are flying is completed, obviously there will be shortfalls in the requirement. There might be one or two. Now comes the dilemma whether to induct the machine with certain shortfalls in the requirements or to wait till all the requirements are sorted out. In case of ALH, I can tell you that uh, when the initial LSPs were inducted, there were shortfalls in the requirement. And whilst we were resolving those shortfalls, users were giving us valuable feedback when they were operating the machines. Now, these feedback also could be, you know, tailored into the machine and to make it a much better machine in the Mark III. Now, for anybody who wants to develop an aircraft, the first challenge is to set up an ecosystem which is required for it. This ecosystem is complex and cannot be erected overnight. As far as we are concerned, the necessary guidance for setting up the ecosystem was given by the R consultants, which is MBB, a German company. And this ecosystem has a variety of components where the loss of even one will cause a system failure. Now here is how the base ecosystem functions. You have designers who conceive a design and you need a manufacturing agency which will give a shape to the design. And then you have test pilots who will fly the design and give a feedback to the designers who will improve, iterate and the wheel cycles as such till you have sorted out all the issues. About manufacturing, luckily HL had enough of manufacturing experience because they had made uh, those 600 odd Chetak Chita helicopters, so manufacturing was not an issue. Test pilots, Indian Air Force had trained adequate number of rotary wing test pilots both in India and abroad, so we had a bank of test pilots to fly the machine. And uh, HL had been regularly inducting designers in the design cadre, 
and there were design bureaus in various groups. Some of the most promising designers were pulled out and put, pulled into the helicopter design bureau at that time for development of ALH. And there was a short film which I wanted to see, which will explain the thing better. The Rotary Way Research and Design Center, RWRDC, has modern facilities and state-of-the-art technologies, spearheads, HLs trust towards excellence in the field of helicopter design. The objective of the center is to research, innovate, and create designs for Rotary Way aircrafts to meet indigenous and global requirements. Hingeless main rotor system and bearingless tail rotor system design is realized using composite blades, hub blades, elastomeric bearings with extensive analysis addressing performance and damage tolerance capabilities and is validated through dedicated testing. To cater to stringent power requirements, the main and tail drive system requires specialized design of gearboxes and drive train systems, pionics and mission control systems covering communication, navigation, ranging, display and attack systems, and mission computer have been developed along with lightweight, crash-worthy composite and metallic structures, crash-worthy landing gear system, integration of power plant, hydraulics, electrical and flight control systems. Now coming to the next piece which is in the ecosystem is something called ground test. Now ground test is the most understated uh, activity but it's a very niche activity where elaborate rigs are made to mimic the flight loads on a component. <coughs> Improper ground test will lead to in-flight failure of the component. Now the life of a component is decided based on the ground test which has been carried out. Here also I would show a short film which will explain the entire thing a little bit better. Sorry, one second. Okay. Now coming to the next piece in the ecosystem, which is the flight test instrumentation. It's again a niche activity where each of the critical components like the main rotor and tail rotor blades, the hubs and the gearbox, boxes, structures, landing gear, etc. are elaborately instrumented. And these loads are telemetered down to a ground station and they are also recorded. Every flight is closely monitored by a team on the ground 
and the pilot is warned if the parameter is going beyond limits. And I have to put a record that I am extremely grateful to them for the numerous warnings they have given me when I have been flying. This approach allows for a very controlled opening of the envelope. Here again I will show you a short film on that which will... Flight Test Center, FTC, has a complete range of facilities for helicopter instrumentation, flight parameter measurement and acquisition from onboard sensor locations, telemetry and data recording. During the flight, the helicopter is tracked automatically in real time and monitored at telemetry ground station. Flight parameters such as temperatures, loads, migrations, controls are observed and any abnormality is communicated to pilots. High-speed computers loaded with indigenous software then process the recorded flight data for further analysis. With two decades of experience in testing drone, FTC is marching along with the progress of helicopter complex. A team of experienced, competent pilots carry out flight trials to assess the performance of the helicopters before certification. Of course, there are other pieces in the question like prototype quality, which is again a very uh, important activity. The people there need to have the experience and the eye for it, unlike normal line quality control. You have certification. Now come to the challenges which we faced in the development of Dhruv. <coughs> Primarily there are three ASRs which dictated the design features which were chosen on the Dhruv helicopter. The first one was the ability to hover at 20,000 feet in OG with a payload of 500 kgs, usual payload of 500 kgs at ISA plus 20. It was a very, very demanding requirement. The second one was the agility requirement of 3.5G, which was the highest ever seen on a rotating platform. And lastly was the entire structure should be 95 percentile crashworthy. To meet these requirements, the team that time, the negotiation committee selected hingeless main rotor, hingeless and bearingless tail rotor system, integrated dynamic system which is a gearbox and crashworthiness to be built into the design structure. All these were cutting edge technology at that time, not used on any helicopter except for crashworthiness which was there in say Apache at that time. Now to meet the 3.5G agility, you had a hingeless rotor system with a very high offset which gave excellent control response and agility which that's how Sarang is able to do all the maneuvers in the displays. It also accorded good degree of stability and flyability, especially at high altitude crews where stability becomes a compromise. But of course, promised less maintenance. The biggest drawback of this configuration was a very high 4 per rev vibrations which we had a hard time to sort out. Finally, we used two levels of passive and active vibration suppressors to give a comfortable ride. Of course, there was other issue of a strong gyroscopic cross-coupling, which was causing control saturation in a left turn, which again required some depth control engineering and AFCS tuning to resolve. The tail rotor blades, we never had any issue with a good, excellent, powerful cable of 90 degrees per second uh, uh, spot turns and failure mitigating. Now, the biggest challenge which we faced was the gearbox design. The committee had selected a squat gearbox, which was unlike the other gearboxes which have been used, the sun and planetary gear system which are flying on 99% of the aircraft, including our new LUH. This design allowed the uh, height of the gearbox to be around 70% 70, 70 of what would be normally seen on a sun and planetary gear configuration system. It had uh, far fewer rotating parts. Now to understand the problem, you need to look inside the gearbox. On the left you see the configuration as shown for a sun planetary gear system, where there are multiple stages of gears, each are packed tightly 
there is no space in between them, the heat dissipation is an issue and they are taller in length, taller in height, sorry. And the negative of this is in case you have a failure of a tooth, it will result in a catastrophic failure of the gearbox. Now you look to the right, which is the ALH gearbox. The beauty is in the simplicity. You have two input shafts which drive a big, huge gear, which drives the main rotor system. Now here, the lot of empty space, if a tooth breaks here, it falls harmless to the bottom. So you cannot have a gear failure, uh, MGB failure in any time. Now, the biggest challenge in this gearbox was manufacturing it. In the initial stages, the gear was cast in Germany. It used to go to UK for machining. And from there, the gear, the big huge collector gear used to be sent to US for fitting the SKF bearing. Thereafter, it used to come back to India. It used to take one year to build the gearbox. But now everything is done in India here at HL. And uh, of course, it required a lot of consultancy and iteration to resolve this. Today we have resolved the entire issue. Coming to the last challenge was the crashworthiness. You need to understand what crashworthiness is. In case a helicopter impacts the ground at around say 2000 feet per minute rate of descent, the g-force of the impact on the occupants would be up to 45 to 50 g. Now the body is capable of only taking about 14.5 g. So now crashworthiness means that in case it impacts at such velocity, the people inside should not be, uh, you know, they should not go beyond the 14.5 g. So they can walk out. Also the structure around the occupants inside the aircraft, whether it's in the cockpit or in the cabin, should not crumple, like the gearbox should not cave in and crush the uh, occupants. And lastly, the fuel, which is a fire hazard, needs to be contained. That the tanks should be crashworthy, they should not explode or rupture. And the coupling should be self-sealing. Now, this is achieved by a, a, a very, very choreographed uh, structural uh, activity, where initially the landing gear stroke, thereafter the bottom structure of the fuselage crumples, and the rest is taken by the seat which is our uh, particular design. Now on the left you see the helicopter pre-impact. You find the undercarriage is there, the bottom structure is all okay and pilot is seated or the passenger is seated upright. After the crash you can see the seat, the undercarriage has stroked fully, the bottom structure has crumpled and the seat has stroked all the way to the bottom. That's why you're sitting on the floor and the large masses on top have not caved in. This activity, this design which is there in the ALH was extremely difficult to achieve, but we have achieved it. This slide summarizes all our efforts towards development of Dhruv, which is the, the Dhruv landing at Sonam at ISA plus 20 in peak summers with a payload of 640 kgs. There was no issue with stability, control margin, that is rudder or any other control margin or power. Now let's see the designs and development in India. We started with ALS Dhruv Mark 1, then we came with the Mark 2, the glass cockpit and Mark 3 with all the improvements and feedbacks which we got. Then on the Mark 3 we integrated the weapon systems, the rockets, the air to air missile, air to ground and various sensors. Thereafter we made the dedicated attack helicopter with LCH which the production uh, commenced this year and will be in a position to give the first production aircraft. And now we are flight testing the LUH, light utility, with a three-ton helicopter, which will replace the Chetak Chita. And work has already started on a 12 to 14 ton class, which is the IMR, Indian Multi-Role Helicopter. We'll just quickly go over these particular designs. <laughs> this is LCH and it's beautiful. I would like to quote uh, the our uh, vice chiefs, vice chief of air staffs, after he flew it in a dive, he says this is as stable as a MiG 27, which is true. 
and uh, you can have a look later, we'll show you. Every bit is designed into it. Here is a photograph showing the uh, IR uh, exhaust suppressor, which was designed and uh, our consultant was a Canadian company called Davis. After the exhaust suppressor put, no missile can, uh, no lock on till you are very, very close. Very nice design. This is the operating at Neoma and the Chota film. Now, I wanted to show you what we did in the Iron Fist. See, normally in the Iron Fist, when the firing was being done, most of the people, aircraft were coming in straight, entering a dive and delivering the weapons. Here we wanted to display the agility of the aircraft. So, what we wanted to show was, we came in very, very low at around uh, 30 feet deck level, came, pulled up at a specific point, turned by about 130 degrees and delivered our target. Our exposure time to any ground uh, weapon would have been less than a minute. Please have a look. Now here's the same system, the weapon acquisition systems are so beautiful that you can be operating at any time. Now, pre presently what we are flight testing is a light utility helicopter. We expect the flight testing to be completed by maybe early next year, by say January, February, March and be ready for induction by June 
of July. Now it's a three-ton class to replace Chetak Chita and it is far, far superior. It's got everything here is more or less indigenous. In the glass copy done by a Madras company. The transmission is done locally. It's a sun planetary gear configuration system. Engines are same as Shakti. And it has a useful payload of around 150 kgs. Two passengers, uh, six passengers and two pilots can cruise at 250, a range greater than 400 and a service heading of 6.5 kilometers. It will outperform the cheetah in every way, in every, every way. Now coming to what we are presently envisaging for uh, say 10 years from today, or 8 years from today, is the Indian multi-role helicopter, which will be for both Army Air Force and the Navy. This will be in 12 to 14 ton class. Okay, uh, it will carry about much more than 24 passengers, Retractable landing gear, IADS, and five bladed main rotor with a four bladed uh, tail rotor. Cruise speed of around 250, service ceiling of 6.5 kilometers. Now, if you compare the sizes of the contemporary other machines of the same weight class, NH90,